Uh, being here tonight and welcome you. This is our second conference. The first one was our founding conference, which was a year and a half ago in Albany, New York, uh, my hometown. Since that year and a half, the world has changed in incredible ways that none of us could have expected, interpreted, thought of a year and a half ago. Uh, we've witnessed incredible austerity programs being implemented in the United States, Europe, and around the world. We have seen increased wars. We have seen an invasion of Libya. But we have seen a fight back. We have seen 10 general strikes in Greece. We have seen Wisconsin occupied. We have seen Wall Street occupied and hundreds of other cities throughout the country occupied. But we continue to see more war, more austerity, and more oppression. There's been a huge attack on civil liberties that has happened in this country. Some of those people have been attacked, you might see on these posters right here. They're from Project Salam, which does this great job. If you go out to their table there, you'll see a big wall with the names, mostly of Muslims, who have started around the attacks on Muslims. Hundreds of Muslims have been put in prison for doing nothing for preemptive prosecution, meaning that they didn't do anything, but the government either set them up or thought they might do something and found ways to put them in prison. The poster right in front here is Lynn Stewart, who is a member of the Coordinating Committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. today is a political prisoner. When she was convicted, they gave her a sentence of two years. And then the government said to the judge, that's not enough. We want you to give her 10 years. And so he turned around and gave her 10 years. Her husband is here. Uh, tonight he's with us and will be speaking during this conference this, this week and I told him we're going to have a party pretty soon when we get him steward out. <laughs> We've seen the National Defense Authorization Act calls for $662 billion for war. That's $2,200 for this coming year, for every man, woman, and child in this country. So for a family of four, their contribution to the wars is about $10,000 for this year. And we know from past experiences that there are supplemental budgets as they run out of money as it goes along. But the other thing about the National Defense Authorization Act, it allows for the military to pick anybody up they want in this country without charges. Hold them indefinitely without trial. We have seen these new trespass laws, which said that if you are doing a protest where there are someone, a person who is being protected by the Secret Service, it is a felony. Even if you don't know that inside the building you're protesting at, there is someone, they can hold you for a felony and put you in jail for up to 10 years. These are the civil liberties that we are seeing intact right now. This conference will be organizing toward for people to move towards Chicago in May when NATO and the G8 come here. With all that has happened in the world, from the Arab Spring to the youth rebellions in Britain, Chile, to the occupations, all that has happened in the world, if NATO and the G8 came here and we did not protest, it would be a blow to all of those movements. But when we do protest in massive numbers as we are going to do, 
it will be a boost to all of those movements. And so we will be organizing at this conference to get as many people as we can to Chicago in May. The panel tonight is entitled The Shifting Strategies of Empire. This will talk about the changes that have happened in the last year and a half since UNAC was formed. And we have an incredible panel here. If you read the original schedule, you saw that Zamara De Zelaya, the candidate uh, for president from Honduras, is supposed to be on this panel, and she is not here. And I'm sorry to tell you that, because she uh, is sick tonight and cannot be here. But we have some substitutes for her. We have Sergio Fernandez, who's from the Academic Council of the National University of Colombia, and Lucy Pugada, who is from the National Resistance Popular Front from Honduras. <laughs> I'm first going to introduce David Swanson, who is an author of the Military Industrial Complex at 50 and a leader of War is a Crime, formerly after Downing Street an anti-war leader, someone you see at every action that is called against the wars, David Swanson. Thank you. President Obama this week declared the war on Iraq to be an honorable success that has given us a brighter future. Are you fired up? Ready to go? Eric Holder this month explained that it's legal for a president to kill anyone anywhere or to imprison them or to spy on them. I started to get upset about this, but then I remembered Holder is a Democrat. Yeah. Made me feel a lot better. <laughs> Leon Panetta told Congress this month that a president can launch a war without Congress and without the United Nations and without any legal restrictions, that a NATO decision to go to war makes it legal, that a decision by an ad hoc coalition to go to war makes it legal, that in fact there isn't a way for a U.S. president to go to war that isn't legal. And at first this sounded like a dangerous doctrine, until I remembered. The president is not a Republican, and no Republican will be president for at least several months. Nothing to worry about. Hillary Clinton this week said that we couldn't end the war on Afghanistan without first protecting women's rights. Already, we have set up a government that endorses wife beating. Perhaps once it mandates invasive ultrasounds, we can leave with honor. In the past three years, largely in the absence of a peace movement, we've seen military spending rise, we've seen drone war wars burst onto the scene in a major way, we've seen murder become the new torture, we've seen wars launched without even bothering to lie to Congress, and in fact with the intentional avoidance of any congressional authorization, we've seen special forces in over a hundred countries, massive escalation of a war in Afghanistan, bases imposed on more countries, an intense effort to surround China and the people of Okinawa be damned, the people of Jeju Island be damned, the Marines going into Australia, we're ruining Vicenza, Italy, we're weaponizing space, and we're being told that the wars must continue so that our troops, dying more from suicide than anything else, will not have been killing themselves in vain. We're told that more wars are needed as generous humanitarian philanthropy. We must bomb more nations because we care. We must have good wars instead of bad wars. We must send a brutal cop to lead the oppression of the nonviolent protesters in Bahrain, but send weapons to help the people of Syria because we love them, or as John McCain recently put it, because overthrowing their government would be a blow to Iran, which also needs to be overthrown. I don't know about you, but I've had enough. I've had enough of calling the War Department the Defense Department. I've had enough of war criminals going on book tour instead of trial. I've had enough of asking that the, that the wars obey the rules of war, like asking rapists to wear condoms. I've had enough of calling by the name service 
anything that a member of the so-called service does other than resistance and conscientious objection. I've had enough of being told I should be outraged by urination on corpses. I'm not. I'm outraged by the murder that produces the corpses. I've had enough of being told that the environmental crisis is separate from the biggest destroyer of our natural environment, which must be patriotically supported. I've had enough of efforts to protect civil liberties, jobs, education, health care, retirement, the rule of law, and basic human decency without taking on the monstrosity that means death to all of the above, the military-industrial complex. It is a trillion-dollar banker bailout every year that we never get back. Belief in humanitarian war keeps the dollars flowing into the beast that produces all the actual wars, the non-humanitarian wars, the murderous wars. We don't distinguish between good and bad rape, just and unjust slavery. When our great-great-grandparents outgrew dueling as a means of settling individual disputes, they didn't ban aggressive dueling. They didn't keep defensive dueling around. When a movement to abolish war grew up at the turn of the last century, and then World War I convinced virtually everybody that the time had come to abolish war. A lawyer in Chicago named Samuel Oliver Levinson, Yale class of 88, 1888, got his friends together and created an international movement for outlawry, to outlaw war. And by 1928, the wealthy armed nations of the world and some of the poorer nations too had signed a treaty banning all war. Recognition of gains made through war ceased, wars were prevented, and World War II was followed by trials for the brand new crime of war, and the rich nations never made war on each other again. They just make war on poor countries. And they lose, and they destroy themselves in the process, and the nobility and courage and sacrifice and solidarity that used to be found, or at least sought, in war is now found in nonviolent activism. It's in the Arab Spring, it's in Wisconsin, it's in Occupy. In Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. this past fall, the police gave us a deadline to leave. We threw a dance party instead. And the police came back to us and said, we've got another idea for you. Why don't you stay? Here's a permit for four more months. And it's in those moments when it's possible to see people come to believe that they have the power to end war. This May, this March 30th, we need people back in Washington, D.C., and this May, we need to be in Chicago when NATO comes. Our grandparents in the 20s rejected the League of Nations and other alliances as the sort of entanglement that had led to World War I. NATO is just that sort of entanglement, a solution to war that facilitates war. We need to go to Chicago in the name of S.O. Levinson, the Chicago activist who decided that war could not be ended with the threat of war, that war could only be ended by ending war. In 1927, a Republican Secretary of State was cursing peace activists. In 1928, he was doing exactly what they told him to do, organizing the nations of the world, including the nation of Persia, to formally renounce war. That happened because a small group of people made a moral case against mass murder and persuaded the rest of the country that war was good for absolutely nothing. Thank you.